What's up? It's Mom Show back with another session of Get Schooled. Are you ready for today's pop quiz? How does Ethernet work in a wireless network where there are legacy technologies like TDM and ATM? Is it A, deploys MSPPs that work with legacy and new technologies? B, 3.21 gigawatts of electricity to the flux capacitor? Or C, the Ethernet's connected to the copper, the copper's connected to the lambda? I could do this all day. Don't know the answer? Don't worry. Sit back and relax. It's time to get schooled. Hello, I'm Ted Meister with Tell Labs. I'm here with Brian Tan from our Singapore office. And we're here today in the luxurious Telabs Lounge to talk about opportunities and challenges in global wireless markets. Brian, welcome. Brian, here in North America, we're looking at 70% penetration in the wireless market. The European Union is claiming nearly 100% total saturation in their wireless markets. So these markets are tapped. However, around the world, there's incredible growth potential. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your region? The APEC region is seeing tremendous growth in the wireless space. Uh, that's driven primarily by the developing countries, India, China, as well as Indonesia. India last year, in 2006, added 66 million mobile subs to bring their total number to 120 million. While that might seem a big absolute number, when you contrast that against their overall population size of 1.2 billion people, um, you're really looking at 10% penetration. China, as of today, probably has around 400 million mobile subscribers out of 1.4 billion. So that puts them in the high 20s, close to 30% penetration rate. Indonesia, another country with 250 million population, has about 17 to 18% mobile penetration rate. And so really there's a lot of headroom for growth for these countries as far as wireless is concerned. Now, in fact, wireless has become so predominant that in some instances it has overtaken the wireline sector as the main means of communications. Going back to India, they have 36 million landlines and 120 million mobile lines. And so you are really looking at a ratio of 1 to 4 skewed in favor of mobile and will increase as the years go by. The common denominator across all these developing countries is that the key criteria for success is really the competitiveness of the mobile subscription or the mobile plan. Um, to give you an extreme example, India for example, you can make a call anywhere within India for one rupee a minute. That's equivalent to making a call from New York to San Francisco for two cents a minute. And on top of that, you get to make, you get to make in, receive incoming calls for free for a lifetime if you sa sign up to that operator. So it's tremendous plans at very, very, very cheap rates. And that in turn put pressure on the operators to offer cheap service, but at the same time offer uh, to, to cost optimize all their operations and capex. So we're talking on the order of billions of potential subscribers, which is great. However, there are some challenges in these markets. To deploy traditional T1, E1 based transport and backhaul is rather expensive. The costs are going down, but to deploy 3G services is going to be pretty demanding. Right, so we need to put in the E1 and T1 backhaul in the context of their overall spend. So backhaul typically accounts for 20 to 25 percent of the mobile operator's operating costs. And as 3G comes along, the backhaul cost hits an inflection point because in 2G, you one or two E1s would suffice. Now for 3G and HSDPA, you are looking at potentially three, four, or even five E1s per cell site to give you 10 megabits download to that cell site. And so the operators need to break the linear cost curve of keep renting more and more E1s. So the, the T1 E1 model is not sustainable and it's not scalable. 3G. There are no economies of scale. Correct. So as the industry moves to, de to deploy more 3G services, what are some of the challenges that operators face? Well, the biggest challenge they face, or one of the biggest challenge they face, is to try to reduce the backhaul costs, which typically constitute about 20 to 25 percent of their operational costs, which is a significant percentage of the overall cost. There are alternative technologies available if they want to continue on the leasing model, i.e. they continue to lease um, capacity from the fixed line carrier to backhaul the 
uh, traffic from the cell site to the cell site controller. And really the alternative technologies are Ethernet and DSL. And so these are very price attractive uh, technologies uh, when compared to T1, E1. Uh, to give you an example, the average price of a 10 meg Ethernet across the board, and that's a, a generalized number, is that a 10 meg Ethernet would cost three and a half times as much as five E1s would cost, which would give you an equivalent bandwidth. Uh, but what really the Ethernet does, or the DSL does, is to give a more effective cost per bit performance uh, that would reduce the operating cost. So that's one model where they continue to lease capacity. The other model, if they have the facility and the resources and in place, i.e. fiber to hub sites, then they can actually build their own infrastructure rather than lease it. And that's where MSPP technology uh, comes in very helpful. And the MSPP technology allows them to build once and use many times. Uh, it allows them to take in the existing 2G uh, transmission. It allows them to cater to the high-speed Ethernet transmission that HSDPA brings along. And, or, or when HSUPA comes along, it allows also HSUPA to go onto the same platform. So is MSPP the technology of choice for migrating into an IP-based uh, network? Well, the MSPP is a, a, a big option. Uh, the other option, like I mentioned, is the Ethernet and the DSL flavors, where they continue to lease from operators uh, these uh, fixed capacities. Uh, but MSPP definitely is a big, uh, big option for mobile operators. Telebs, in response to the demands of, for MSPP in the mobile space, has developed the 6325, the world's smallest fully featured compact MSPP. We develop it to be compact because we understand that in the cell site, space is an absolute premium. So we've got a 1U-high 6325 that can scale from STM1, which is 155 meg, to STM16, which is 2.5 gig, in the same form factor so that it can support the increasing traffic that 3G brings uh, into the trans transmission network. In addition, the 6325 uh, being compact, we don't sacrifice redundancy. Now it goes back to the previous point where we said redund redundancy and re resilience and reliability is a key component for the service provider's uh, end user offering. And so being a redundant box, fully redundant box at 1U, which is a fairly unique feature today, uh, is very important in the mobile space, especially for 3G. That wasn't so hard, was it? The correct answer is A. Deploy MSPPs Blah, blah, blah. You know the answer. And in case you didn't get it right, you can always grab a cheat sheet at inspirethenewlife.com. I'll see you next time. And remember, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm.